Hi, welcome everyone again to another financial analysis video with myself, Moe Damin, and Ted Wayman. We're going to be looking at AB InBev today. Uh, so uh, I think the first or maybe second of the drinks companies that we have done as an analysis in, uh, in this podcast show. So before we get into that and some, some interesting things that we've looked at, well, regular things that we've looked at in the company, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, especially if you've um, requested a video, you will get the notification. Uh, so let's dive right in. Uh, so a new CEO for AB InBev and the world's largest drinks brand uh, and they have um, several drink brands under their under their portfolio. So, you know, Bex, Budweiser, Lefe, Corona Extra, etc. Um, they have a new CEO which joined in July 2021. Well, not joined, but became CEO in July 2021. He's been in the business for a very long time. Uh, Michael Dukeris. Uh, what's interesting is that he's looking to sell the German uh, beer brands that they have in their portfolio to the tune of probably about $1.2 billion. Now that's still to be decided. You're not going to see that in our financial analysis today, but it is worth um, keeping a note of that uh, as part of your investment thesis. Remember, as we say in all of our videos, this is just the retrospective, right? It's a backward looking glance at the business, but it is an important one as part of your investment thesis. Um, quick points about the share price. Um, so uh, they've been around, I think, since 2000, and it's been a, a bit of a roller coaster. If you invested uh, five years ago, uh, you would have lost money. Um, if you invested one year ago, uh, so around October of 2020, you would have lost money, but it would have gone through a bit of a roller coaster. So there was a point where there was quite a high peak. So uh, as, as with the uh, stock prices, timing is everything. So we'll go into that later on. So stick around and you'll see some of the details around that. So Ted, let's, uh, let's dive straight in. What, uh, what have we found about AB InBev? and uh, this very large uh, brewer. Um, well, thank you very much, Moeed. And yes, very good to see you. This is obviously our second um, company. The first one we looked at was BrewDog, if you remember. Um, uh, and uh, you mentioned um, uh, like, share, subscribe. Um, this is obviously uh, at the request of one of our subscribers. Um, so Matthew uh, Newport Jones, um, uh, this uh, video is for you. Um, you also mentioned that this is very much a backward looking video, uh, and I will reiterate that, um, that if somebody says to me, you know, you're not looking at what's happening in the future. Um, well, no, this is financial analysis. We're looking at the financial statements and they will tell you what happened in the past. Um, and as you and I know, uh, the past performance is no uh, guarantee of future performance. And also one last caveat, uh, Moe, while we're there, uh, timing is everything. But timing is a mugs game, a mug. If you think you can time the markets, um, then I, I think that you are kidding yourself. Very few people are able to time the markets. And therefore, really, what we're looking at is a fu fundamental analysis. Um, if you like the shares, if you like the stock, if you think the numbers are adding up and if everything else adds up, then uh, invest and ride the waves. OK, long term investing. This is not uh, this is not a, a forum for day traders uh, and high frequency hedge funds. OK, so with that in mind, here is InBev and this is their annual report for 2020. So a little bit out of date now as we're getting into the kind of the last part of 2021. It's now October, um, but still this is the uh, these are the numbers, the latest set of uh, financially audited numbers. And like any audit report, you will find lots and lots of information. So lots of information about the company, about its performance, about the kind of breakdown. Um, most of this will be very much kind of, you know, the uh, spin on there, the company giving you uh, the kind of the positive story that they want you to take away. Um, but we are going to be going right the way through and looking at the financial statements. So the financial statements for InBev are on page 25 of their accounts. So first thing we see is top line looking at the revenue. The revenue has fallen from 2019 down to 2020. Now, there's a number of different reasons why the revenue might have fallen. But I think that the reason for this um, is uh, uh, contained a little bit further uh, down when we see that they have actually um, 
uh, they've sold a business. So um, they they're actually uh, they they sold a, a a part of the business, um, and uh, and that's why it's fallen. So rather than just shrinking market share, this is part of their ongoing changing strategy. Uh, and as you mentioned, there are other parts of the business um, up for sale as they try and exit certain parts and move into other areas. They're still profitable and they're making a very high margin. So this is really, this is a, a 60% margin business. Um, so uh, bear that in mind. Every time you buy a beer, um, you're not buying the beer, you're buying the brand. Um, uh, and that's really what these guys are in. They're, they're, they're in sort of, you know, producing a, a you know a product whether it's a, a beer or a whiskey uh, or whatever it is um uh, and then making sure that the brand and the and the uh uh the the, the value of that brand is reflected in the price uh, and getting us to pay a kind of a premium price for what is essentially a, a pretty standard um, underlying product it's all about the brand here uh, and because it's all about the brand, you'll notice that they actually highlight the sales and marketing expenses. So they've actually given you a kind of uh, the distribution expenses are relatively high sales and marketing. And that will mainly be marketing and advertising and the kind of the sponsorship. For example, think about premium drinks, uh, uh, sponsoring a, a premium um, uh, events, sporting events, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they split that out from the admin expenses, which is just the kind of cost of running the business, rent rate, light heat, finance team, HR team, facilities, IT, all those kind of, you know, those normal costs you'd usually see. Um, and, and then, you know, these distribution expenses, again, quite a lot because, you know, physically they've got all these bottles of, of, of beer and so on and so forth, and they need to be shipped around the world. And that's pretty expensive. Anyway, so what do we come down to? Uh, operating profit, pretty profitable, uh, a nice kind of 20% in this year, down from 30% in the previous year. Um, uh, and that's probably because um, the, the, you know, the costs have come down, um, but you know, this is really a kind of a fixed cost business. So these are the fixed costs um, and you've got to pay them whether you're running lots of brands or only a few brands. So we're going to, we have seen the, uh, the operating margin has dropped from 30% down to 20%. Um, this impairment, just worth um, identifying this impairment of goodwill. So goodwill arises on the acquisition of another business. So this is where you buy another business. Uh, and these guys, you know, they bought other businesses, they bought um, uh, other brands effectively. And when they buy those brands, what they're really buying is the brand. Uh, and that's the value um, uh, that they, uh, that they, uh, that that's effectively the difference between the net asset value and, and the price that they've paid. And obviously, um, this is reflecting some of the brands um, that they are, um, that they're not happy with and, and that they are, they, they've actually reduced that goodwill. So they've taken a hit. So these numbers here really kind of represent a kind of a, a one-off. You'll notice restructuring, which basically says redundancy. They've got COVID costs in there. They've got this impairment of goodwill. They weren't in there last year uh, and they're not expected to be in there next year. So this is a kind of, this is a one-off. Um, uh, and, and so they're trying to get down to this profit and operations before and they've highlighted these non-recurring items now i always get a little bit nervous about non-recurring items because often you find that the non-recurring items sent, tend to recur uh, on a quite a regular basis but i'm reasonably comfortable uh, that these guys really are talking about non-recurring items it doesn't look like they're going to be um uh you know again you can see the restructuring is kind of almost the only one um which is on an ongoing basis but there's not going to be that much restructuring going on uh, into the future. So um, scrolling down uh, to the bottom half of the uh, income statement, uh, they're profitable, they, they're generating, they got quite a lot of um, finance costs. That means that they're carrying quite a lot of debt. Um, and what we'll probably find when we look at the balance sheet is that they've used the debt in order to buy, um, uh, in order to fund uh, this acquisition, yet they can still afford that. The debt looks like the debt has gone up. But the debt, even compared with the um, the profit from operations after the one-off costs, um, is you know they're still able to um, uh, to afford that debt. However, we don't want to see interest rates going up too much. We might compare that to the um, the original uh, sort of you know the underlying uh, operating profit. Again, it's even more healthy. So, bottom line, they're profitable, but they were nowhere near as profitable as they were in the previous year mainly because of things like that write down in goodwill, 
the the the, the fall in the um uh, you know the, the shrinking of the business through disposal of of a of, an, of, a, of a, a part of the business. So here we go. There's the profit from discontinued operations. So this I think um reflects the fact that they have they have sold part of the business um and that's why their their revenue has shrunk effectively. Um and uh yeah are, are paying a little bit of tax so they are profitable but they are not nearly as profitable they've dropped from a from a net margin of 20 percent down to five percent it looks like there's a there's a bit of kind of just restructuring going on in the business and once they get through that they then just stop consolidate settle down that last piece of business that they um they're looking to sell um goes uh, and then they start to kind of really make sure that they can kind of return to the original levels of profitability and you'll probably find that this these numbers are reflected in the um uh, in the financial statements sorry in the share price so there's the um income statement um if we carry on down to the uh, the balance sheet, this is the statement of financial position. So in terms of the balance sheet, um, the assets, the non-current assets, these are the things that we need to run the business. Um, about 200, um, uh, uh, two, sorry, 200,000 million. So that's uh, 200 billion of, of assets. So that's, you know, pretty, give you an idea of how big they are. It's a pretty big number. Um, and we notice the biggest number easily is this goodwill. And the goodwill as we mentioned, arises on acquisition. When you buy, when you buy a, 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 a you know a, um, a a drinks manufacturer, you know you're buying the brewing site and so on and so forth. But what you're really buying is that brand, and so you're paying a premium for that brand. You're paying for the income it generates, um, and therefore a lot of goodwill um, uh, is generated. So they've got a lot of this um, this goodwill. They've got some other intangible assets. Note 15 will tell us what they are. Probably things like um, um, you know licenses um, and patents, for example and uh, a little bit of property plant and equipment there it is up there so that's the actual sort of physical assets they have for um for producing their um uh, their drinks down in the current assets um we noticed a lot of cash so 15 um uh, 15 billion of cash sitting on the balance sheet um uh, which gives them a, a pretty strong balance sheet certainly up from the previous year and you'll notice that a lot of that will be driven by these assets held for sale um effectively um uh, they sold them for cash and now they've got that cash they can use that either to continue to expand the business or they can use it just to kind of you know fund um existing operations but overall looks a pretty strong top half of the balance sheet. Um, interesting enough, if we go to the bottom half of the balance sheet, and while we do that, just remember this, this current assets of 26 um, a, a billion, which you can see up at the top of the screen. Um, if I just shrink it down a little bit so we can actually um, uh, see that. So the 26 billion up at the top of the screen, which is the, um, the, the, the current assets, Quite often we compare that to the current liabilities and the current liabilities 32 billion um, suggests there's an issue around liquidity now um, this business it doesn't look like it necessarily is a kind of a naturally strong cash flow business but what is interesting is that these guys have very very high payables so this number here is incredibly high uh, and suggests that they're not very good at paying their suppliers um, now, I don't know whether that's the actual reality, um, but certainly I get the impression that these guys are using a bit of their kind of their negotiating power. It's a big company and they just say, look, we're going to pay you in 120 days or 180 days, in which case it allows them to operate at that at that low um, liquidity uh, ratio, that, that, that low um, uh, ratio between the current assets and the current liabilities. Um, nothing else really jumping out um, uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the balance sheet. You'll notice that they've got some, some current um, uh, debt uh, as the short term debt and some long term debt. So there's the long term debt um, as we expected. So they've grown through acquisition and a lot of that acquisition is funded through debt. Uh, and that's driving the, um, uh, you know, all of that interest payments that we saw on the income statement. Um, and uh, you know they're they're probably going to refinance that debt, and we'll look, we'll check that in the um in the cash flow when we look at it. Um, the only other thing to look at is um obviously things like you know we got this deferred tax liability, so that's quite a big uh, a big number. Um, otherwise, 
nothing really to kind of you know get too too worried about um the the equity they got a nice positive balance sheet 78 billion um and predominantly funded through um these retained earnings so there's the retained earnings um uh, and then up at the top this is the uh, what's been actually um uh, uh, issued um uh, uh, invested by the shareholders so they're not doing any any equity funding you can see there's no kind of there's no difference between these numbers here um and uh, it looks to me like they are probably paying out dividends which we can confirm now so balance sheet looking reasonably healthy um i, I guess as i said the the only kind of question mark would be the current assets versus the current liabilities um but they've got quite a lot of cash um it just it just looks like they it just looks like they're slow payers. So um, if you are uh, using this uh, analysis to assess um, the kind of payment terms or whether you want to do business with these guys, make sure that you've got strong cash flow um, uh, when you go into the negotiation. Um, here we see the movement in um, uh, equity. And just a thing to, to we're, we're really focusing on, on um, let me just change the color so we can see this. So we're focusing on this uh, column here, which is the retained earnings. Um, so what you'll notice is last year, there was a, a dividend of about uh, 4 billion. And if we just scroll down a little bit to see this year, the dividend, so there's still a dividend. In fact, let me just move this onto the screen so we can see that, there we go. Um, so the, there's still a dividend, but the dividend has fallen to 1 billion. So real sense here that these guys, they kind of like, maybe it's, pandemic they've kind of said whoa hold on a sec we need to kind of you know just uh, uh, uh stay off a little bit um uh, and we need to make sure that we can actually afford that dividend so significant drop in the dividend will it come back or will they maintain it at a billion again i'm not absolutely certain but you know that is a variable income at the behest of the uh, the directors of the company uh, and so the final statement is the cash flow um and looking at the cash flow, you know, good, strong cash flow for this company. So uh, here's the cash flow from the operating activities, 11 billion, down from 14 billion in the previous year. But again, um, you know, some really good, strong cash flows coming through. Um, uh, so underlying, they, you know, it's a, it's a strong, it's a strong cash flow business. Um, in terms of what are they doing with that cash flow? scroll down a little bit further and again that 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 strong cash flow will probably uh, be another part of kind of allowing them to operate at this at this um this low liquidity um ratio the low current ratio we saw earlier um we also notice uh, in terms of the cash flow from the investment side um so this this number here this is the kind of the the, the cash generated uh, or the cash used in investing you'll notice it's positive for this year and the reason it's positive is because of the sale there's the cash from the sale so that they got 11 billion dollars from the sale uh, of their uh, uh, australia um uh, divestiture and um uh, and that's a part of the reason why the income that the turnover has come down and it's also shown as um a, a profit on this disposal in the income statement and it also reflects as to why they've got so much cash um and then finally, we can see down the bottom the kind of the proceeds from borrowings. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, here, we can see that they are actually um, uh, they're raising money, they're repaying money, so their their debt is going down. You notice the difference between those two. Um, so they're trying to reduce their debt, um, pay a little bit of dividends, and so they're using some of that cash generated. Not only are they actually uh, uh, ending up with cash in the bank, a decent cash. Um, a cash balance, um, but they've also been using it to pay down debt. And I think that kind of makes sense because it looks, you know, the debt looks quite high, um, uh, especially that that six billion of interest, if you're only making nine billion of operating profit, or even if it's 12 billion underlying operating profit, you wouldn't really want to be getting much more than that because it, it becomes a little bit higher risk, if that makes sense. So really from the financial perspective, you know, nothing 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 to see here i think is is kind of the answer it, that there's nothing really jumping out at me there's nothing sort of saying oh gosh uh, here's an issue um you know they they they, they I, I, i'm pretty confident that they're operating within the right levels of the working capital i think they've got probably a little bit more than half an eye on the level of debt um 
I think that they are, you know, that they're, they're just restructuring their business uh, in order to kind of, um, you know, take advantage of, um, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the new post pandemic world, perhaps. So um, you mentioned the share price. Let's have a look at how it's been um, going. So, you know, as you mentioned, um, uh, it, it's kind of gone all the way up and all the way back down again. Um, and even in the last, um, you know, in, in, in the last you know, year or so, it's been bouncing around um, a little bit. So we're interested in the market cap, 79 billion. Don't forget that when we uh, talk about that 79 billion, the net asset value uh, of this business um, in terms of the size of the balance sheet is about 78 billion. So you're kind of looking at, um, you know, you're paying almost bang on the net book value for this company. So in terms of the valuation, the net book value, <coughs> you know, there's, there's, there's no goodwill in that, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, you pay 70 or you pay 80 billion is effectively what it is there. You're paying 80 billion for a company which has net assets of 80 billion. OK, and so, you know, that as a general rule uh, that says, um, you know, this is a good potential. Um, the P.E. ratio, that's the price to earnings, uh, 20 times earnings. That's, you know, it's it's not it's not cheap. It's not overly expensive. I think the, the US market as a whole is trading on a 30 times um, PE ratio. So um, 20 times, think about that, just flip it upside down and you get the yield. It's about a 4% yield. Um, and I think that, you know, potentially, potentially this is, you know, this is, this is a, 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 this is, might be an opportunity looking at where the share price is right now, where it's been in the past, uh, and thinking about where it can possibly go in the future, um, this certainly isn't one to avoid. Let's put it like that. So, um, you know, maybe it's something to buy into. Uh, again, uh, you know, you're not going to see it. I don't see, think you're going to see a 20 bagger or a 50 bagger. This is not your kind of, you know, your kind of shoot for the stars and retire early kind of one. Um, but this might be, uh, you know, once again, um, uh, you know, a, a small part of a well diversified portfolio, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes total sense. And I thought what you said was uh, about the um, trade receivables um, was very interesting because we have a lot of viewers that uh, don't just look at our videos for investment purposes. They also look at this in terms of understanding, um, you know, business acumen, raising their business acumen, learning how to read financial statements because they're thinking about doing business with some of those companies. So I thought that was very interesting, especially if you're seeking to do business with them, you need to kind of be aware of the fact that they're going to they're going to insist and demand um, high uh, longer payment terms. Right. So that's that's going to be important. Um, yeah. Great analysis. Um, as Ted mentioned earlier, uh, one video that we recommend you look at as a comparison uh, would be uh, Brewdog. Um, obviously, a much smaller brewing company, but certainly will give you some some good comparisons, some good context uh, from another drinks company. Um, and again, don't forget to like, share, subscribe. And until the next video, thank you, Ted. Thank you, everyone else for watching. Good to see you, Moe.